Saint Catherine of Siena, Saint Joseph of Cupertino, Saint Catherine of Genoa, Saint Nicholas of Flu, Blessed Alexandra de Costa, Blessed Anne Catherick Emmerich, and other saints and blesseds, all who I just named, in some point of their holy lives, they fasted completely from ordinary food. Some, not only months, but even years. Even up to 40 years, they did not eat ordinary food. The only food they fed on was the Holy Eucharist. Obviously, this is a very special example that God gives to certain souls that he chooses to live completely by consuming the Blessed Sacrament every day. But the reason why I mention this is to highlight the main message of the Gospel today. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And to add another scripture passage similar to that, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be yours. So in the gospel, there's a large crowd following Jesus. To tell you the truth, the largest crowd number-wise that the gospel has given us. So 5,000 men. Now today's gospel, the version of St. Matthew says, not including women and children. So it could have been maybe even over 10,000 people that were following Jesus Christ. If you can imagine maybe a, a huge football stadium or an arena of people full that were following Jesus. So they weren't necessarily following him for food. The gospel today states that he healed their sick so a lot of people probably bought their relatives or their friends who maybe had a physical ailment or were sick from maybe a fever and they wanted Jesus to heal them. So they were there, maybe lines of people. In another part of the gospel, it states that he put his hand on them individually speaking in another passage. So it just shows you how much he has concern for sick people. But besides wanting to be healed, People were after Jesus, were following him for the fullness of truth. The people of Israel were waiting for the incarnate God for thousands and thousands of years. Although they loved the wisdom of Solomon, there is something greater than Solomon here. So it wasn't just simply for food. So the gospel is very clear. After a long day, they're in a deserted place. For some reason, I think of like the Mojave Desert. I'm from Southern California. It's a huge desert. And they're there and there's nothing else around. And the people have no provisions. They don't have anything to eat. They're there. They want to follow Jesus. They want to be satisfied with his teaching. So, obviously, food comes up. So the disciples asked Jesus, you know, send them away because they need to eat. It's already late. So eventually the apostles get five barley loaves. It's very specific in another gospel, barley loaves and two fish. And notice what Jesus asked them to do. He says, tell them to sit down in rows of fifties and groups of a hundred. And he took the bread gave thanks and broke the bread. And then he in turn gave them to his disciples 
to distribute to all of the maybe 10,000 people. So what was the result? Now it's very clear if you read word for word, line for line in the gospel. They all ate and were satisfied. Obviously this is said not by accident. In another gospel, if you read the gospel of John, now all four gospels have this specific account. The gospel of John says, as much as they wanted, they ate as much as they wanted. Now, for a person that goes to restaurants sometimes, I think of a buffet, like an unlimited amount of food, so to speak, that we can choose from. They got as much as they wanted. And guess what? Who's paying for the bill? It's all on Jesus. So that's a great thing. So everyone's happy. Not only that, as we see in the wedding feast of Cana, when Jesus creates a wine or some food, it's usually the best of foods, at least from what we can gather from what happened at the wedding feast of Cana. So as much as we love maybe Hawaiian bread or wonder bread, this is bread made by Jesus Christ. As much as we love maybe teriyaki salmon, I don't know what type of fish they were eating, it was still most likely the best fish that they ever had. They all ate and were satisfied. So what happens after that? Jesus says, pick up the fragments. Obviously, he knew the exact number of people that were there. He's God. Yet he made more food 12 whisker, wicker baskets left over. So he did that obviously on purpose. God not only provides for what we need, but at times he gives us what we want in overabundance of things, especially spiritual things. So on a natural level, if I could conclude in terms of a, maybe a saying of what the gospel means today, Give us this day our daily bread. We say that every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. And we can obviously uh, interpret that as something that we need materially speaking. But there's a deeper significance. This goes without saying. It's very clear the church fathers state, as they quote the gospel, he took bread and gave thanks and then broke the bread so it's a foreshadowing obviously of holy thursday the last supper it's a foreshadowing of the institution of the eucharist so as much as we want to emphasize the material things that god provides for us multiplying bread for people to eat is good but changing bread and wine into the Eucharist is better, is best. Healing the sick from their infirmities is another good, but forgiving them of their sins is infinitely better. It's what's best in this scenario. Yes, experiencing Jesus in his human nature on earth is good, but being with him forever in heaven is the best thing, really the reason why we exist here on this earth. So in other words, give spiritual concerns priority over material ones. So yes, God provide for a house for us to live in, provide food for us to have all the necessary nourishment that we need, clothes to wear, so forth and so on. Yes, that's good. What's better, what's best? Needs of our souls. For us to get to heaven, for us to become saints, for us to persevere and to be faithful to our vocation every single day. So, Again, take spiritual concerns priority or make spiritual concerns priority over material ones. Now, if you read the Gospel of John, his account, it states that after they were fed, after they were satisfied and got whatever they wanted, they wanted to make him king. 
They wanted to take him and declare him king. They wanted to make him king because they provided for their food. So, in other words, they see Jesus simply as the best social worker. They were only concerned about economic prosperity. They didn't see the whole picture there. So at times, someone may actually even misinterpret this scripture passage. The miracle was that Jesus shared. He didn't really feed five to 10,000 people. That's just symbolic. The miracle is that he shared this bread that maybe he found on the ground or maybe that someone gave him. So that's obviously an erroneous interpretation of the gospel. So what we need to realize here that Jesus fulfills us completely, not simply just by providing for the material needs, but by grace, divine life is what perfects us. So this is what we should really be asking, not just simply in the Our Father of give us this day our daily bread, but thy kingdom come. Jesus, complete me by your sanctifying grace. You know, speaking about this, it reminds me of an experience that I had as a newly ordained priest. It was about over, a little over 10 years ago. And our religious community here, we give our newly ordained priest about a month of vacation before we start our public ministry. So after I was ordained, I spent about three weeks in Southern California with my family and friends, and then I flew to New York. One of the pastors in the Archdiocese of New York asked me to help him set up a family vocation day. And uh, I went along with a friend. But before I met with the pastor and his staff to help organize this day, I wanted to go to New York City to visit some of the churches there. So naturally speaking, I wanted to go to the mother church of New York City, St. Patrick's Cathedral. And again, I was with a friend, so we passed Times Square, probably the busiest place in the United States of America, and we eventually get to the cathedral. So I enter this huge church. And my first inclination as a Catholic, and especially as a priest and a religious, I look down the middle, the center of the church, to see where the tabernacle is and make my genuflection to show an external sign of adoration toward the Blessed Sacrament. But in many cathedrals, the tabernacle is not in the middle. So I tell my friend, I say, David, just give me about 10 minutes because I want to say a prayer for the success of this day that we're about to organize. So I'll meet you back here at the gift shop in about 10 minutes. So at this point, it was my mission to find Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament to say a prayer for the success of this day. So I'm here in this big church and I'm passing by side altar by side altar looking for the tabernacle. And it seemed like every side altar was dedicated to a saint. Most likely there was a relic of that saint in that altar. But I didn't find the tabernacle. And obviously I wanted to say hello to Jesus and say my prayer. So maybe after about 10 minutes, I eventually go to the very back of the cathedral. I actually pass Archbishop Fulton Sheen's grave site, which was below the altar there. And eventually I see 10 pews, I see an altar, and then the tabernacle. So I'm satisfied. Yes, Jesus is in this cathedral. So I genuflect, I kneel down, I close my eyes, and I say a prayer for the success of this day that we're about to organize within the archdiocese. Now, as I had my eyes closed and I was praying, I noticed one thing. It was completely silent in that part of the cathedral. I was just out in Times Square, probably the noisiest place on earth, so to speak, where I couldn't even hear my friend who was right beside me. We practically had to yell in each other's ears to hear ourselves. But yet, 
it was a big contrast of being in a completely silent place in New York City. So I opened my eyes and I noticed one thing. There wasn't one person praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And it, it dawned on me. There's about, what, maybe 8 million people in New York City. And I and realize this is Manhattan. It's just one of the boroughs of New York City. But yet with 8 million people and all of these visitors from all around the world, there wasn't one person praying, adoring, and giving glory to God to the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist? I just couldn't believe it. And there was a sense of sadness that came upon me, especially as a newly ordained priest. I'm ordained especially to celebrate Mass for the Eucharist. So with that sense of sadness, obviously I, I knelt back down and I wanted to say a prayer especially of reparation for all of those, especially Catholics, or a lot of Catholics in New York, in New York City, a lot of Catholics that don't care, that don't make it priority in terms of spending time in front of Jesus in the Eucharist. So why do I tell you a story like this in the context of this homily and the gospel today? Obviously, I'm trying to make you feel guilty if you don't ever spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. But besides that fact, I tell you this just to show you how much Jesus loves us in the Eucharist. You know, think of the things that Jesus has done for us. He has assumed a human nature and became man. He has experienced everything that we have experienced except sin. He knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to have to fold his clothes and make his bed, where he has to read books. God has to do all of these ordinary things that we human beings do. And besides that, for 30 years, after that, he starts his public ministry and he dies the most infamous death by especially his own people who tell Pontius Pilate to crucify him. So here Jesus is naked on the cross so we can be with him forever in heaven. I mean, these, I could go on and on about the incarnation and how it's not only a self-emptying, but an annihilation for God to come down as man. But the point is this, to top it all off, Jesus becomes food for our souls. God becomes something that we can consume. You can't top that. So the reason why Jesus does this is because love seeks union. If you truly love someone, you want to be with them. You know, when you love someone, you want to do favors for them. You give them gifts. You tell them, is there anything that you need? I will be there side by side with you Whenever you have a hard time or difficulties in life, let me know. I love you. But Jesus one-ups one that, so to speak. See, we're limited. When we love someone, we can't give our very selves to them. We can do acts of kindness, but with Jesus, that's exactly what he does. He gives his very self where we consume him, his body, blood, and true human soul, all parts of his humanity, but most especially his divinity. The same divinity he shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit. They all ate and were satisfied. They ate everything, anything that they wanted. Again, a foreshadowing of the Holy Eucharist. Jesus is not simply a social worker. He's not just simply there for economic reasons. He's there to give us eternal life. He's there to give us his very self in the most blessed sacrament. So for us Catholics, the question is, do we put an effort in being a Eucharistic 
soul. You know, life is crazy now. There's a lot of things going on from politics to racism, so to speak, in terms of a lot of people protesting. What comes to mind is a quote from St. Mother Teresa, if every Catholic can spend one hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament, we would have world peace. So if you can make it a resolution to frequent communion, if you can go within your duties of state of life to daily mass, I highly recommend it. But if you can make it a resolution to spend one hour in front of Jesus every week, I guarantee you outside of mass, that will be the best time of your week. And I know people have good intentions. They say, Father, if I have some time, I'll stop by the church. But if you have the Blessed Sacrament somewhat locally, where you can sign up for an hour, I highly recommend that you sign up, you make a commitment. Why? Because we suffer from original sin. When we say that we'll do something in a general way, we usually don't do it at times. Only the real virtuous people do it. But if we sign up, it's like a law, so to speak, in the back of our mind. We committed, we will go. So if, if we do something like that, I guarantee you life will be a lot better, will be more Eucharistic. To have an encounter with our Lord in the Eucharist is worth every sacrifice.